Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Farah, and in today's video, I'm just gonna tell you guys about my January reading wrap up. January was an amazing month for me. I read so many good books that I'm excited to tell you about real quickly. So for the month of January, I was able to read seven books, finish seven books, and um, let's see. So out of those seven books, I was able to read four of my own books, which worked for the Read What You Own Challenge. And I didn't do any real reading challenges other than that, except my Agatha Christie reading her project. So as usual, I'm gonna start with my least rated to my highest rated or favorite book of the month. So first up, we have A Magical New York Christmas by Anita Hughes. And this was, I was reading this a little bit in January, or I was reading this a little bit in December, so it filtered into January. So this was kind of like your typical Hallmark movie in a book type of book, and it was pretty cute. So in this book, we're following Sabrina, who's a struggling writer living in New York City, and she gets a job as a ghostwriter for this very famous art dealer named Grayson. He's an elderly man, I think in his early 80s, and he puts her up at the Plaza Hotel and she gets to come and interview him for a week while living at the Plaza Hotel and kind of all expense paid type of vacation. You know, she's excited to have this opportunity to write the book for him. On the way, she meets a young man named Ian from the UK and they hit it off and they just, they kind of start going on these little dates. So this book has the I don't know if this is a real trope, but it's kind of a deception trope where each Sabrina and Ian think that each other are these very wealthy guests. And so they're kind of pretending to be wealthy also so that they don't get rejected by the other person. And then there's multiple plot lines going on throughout the book. So we're following Grayson's backstory as Sabrina's writing his memoir and what his experience was like working as a butler back in the 60s at the Plaza Hotel in a romance that occurs between him and one of the guests. And then we're following the present timeline, which is Sabrina's own personal romance with this guy named Ian. So what I really liked about this book was that it was very cute. It was cozy. It had a lot of nice Christmas theming and vibes to it. You're getting a lot of descriptions about what New York City looks like at Christmas time. You're getting ice skating in Central Park, that kind of thing. Dinner at the Rainbow Room, um, shopping in the Plaza Hotel gift shop. And then you're also getting um, just a really clean, like cute romance between two people. So um, what I didn't really like so much was the deception trope. It wasn't horrible, but the whole time I'm like, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a writer. There's nothing wrong with being a secretary to British royalty, which is what Ian was. But they just put so much pressure on themselves to pretend to be these wealthy people. And that's just annoying to me, maybe because I'm older. So maybe that trope is just not working for me. Like I'm, it's like communicate with each other, you know? So that was really my only disappointment in the book, but it could have been a lot worse. So overall, I think if you're looking for a cute and cozy holiday read with not a ton of angst and not a ton of spice, you might really enjoy this. I gave it to my mother to read, so I think she would really like it. So I gave it, you know, like three, 3.5 stars. It was cute, but I probably wouldn't reread it. Okay, the next book that I got to, which is another one that I owned, was called Heartstopper, and this was the second volume in the Heartstopper graphic novel young adult romance series. So I believe there's five books out uh, now as, as of the time of this filming, and we have all five, so I'm trying to get through them. I loved the first one, and the second one was just as good. The second one focuses on the growing friendship and relationship between two of our main characters named Nick and Charlie, who are 15 and 16 years old. They go to an all boys school and the setting is in the UK. One of them is openly gay and the other one is um, coming to terms with his sexuality and he is starting to identify as bisexual. And this is kind of his story about what it felt like to start to have these feelings for Charlie that went beyond friendship, that went into love. And it was just a really, these books are so sweet. They're very focused on, on love. So it's not something that's like, you know, graphic or explicit or anything like that. They're very innocent and it, it's more focused on that fuzzy, warm feeling you get when you get a crush on somebody for the first time. But it's just told in such a cute way. It's told through like their emotions and their texts back to one each other. And it just brings you back to that time in high school when you have that first crush. And um, this book in particular focuses a lot on the coming out process and whether or not Nick wants to share these feelings with anyone else. And is it okay to keep the relationship private? Is it damaging to Charlie's self-worth to have to hide? And even though he's openly gay, he's not allowed to like, 
say this is my boyfriend and this and that. So I thought it was handled really well. Um, I love the friendships within this, within this book, how supportive they are. It's just, I, I love this graphic novel series. So I gave that one four and a half stars. I, I mean, it could be five, but I'm trying to save the five star rating for like really amazing. So that was Heartstoppers, really enjoyed that, volume two. Next on the list is another holiday romance that I finally got to finish a book that I owned as well. And this one was called A Kiss for Midwinter by Courtney Milan. And this is a novella, it's pretty short and it's stuck in within an ongoing series that I have not read. I just read the novella and you can read this as a standalone. I didn't find that I was like struggling for information on characters or anything. So for this book, we're following our two main characters. We have Dr. Jonas Grantham, who's a young physician, and we have Lydia Charrington. I think that's her last name. So they're both young. They're in their early 20s or so, and it's set in the Victorian age. So it's like 18 something. I don't remember the 1860s maybe. And um, what happens is that when Lydia was young, about 15 years old, she got pregnant by somebody that lied to her and manipulated her. And Dr. Jonas Grantham was a physician in training at the time that she was being seen. So he knew about her, he knew kind of of the scandal going on. So years later, they meet back up again and they don't recognize each other at first, but Lydia does recognize him and she's very cold towards him. She has a lot of shame and anger about that time in her life. Um, she ended up having a miscarriage, so she doesn't have the child. She had a loss, um, but she's still very emotionally traumatized by the whole event. So uh, Jonas really just is attracted to her. He really likes her. He's really intrigued about her. And once he realizes who she is, he kind of understands why she's kind of set back from him. So what I liked about this book is that it follows two characters that are pretty flawed. Um, he sounds like he could maybe have some OCD going on, some perfectionism. And then the other one, she just has her own sort of shame to deal with. Um, I liked that this novel had a lot of depth for being a romantic uh, novella, holiday novella. And I liked how we see Jonas struggling with taking care of his elderly father with health issues, who's also a hoarder, and how that affects Jonathan's, like, or Jonas's sense of wanting things to be neat and tidy and how they kind of um how Lydia is able to sort of unpack her own shame and anger over the situation she went through and how she healed from that so it was really cute it was short it was sweet it had nice Christmas theming to it and I really enjoyed it it had some spice in it too which was fun um so if you're a fan of holiday romance novellas I highly recommend this one I gave it four stars so the next book I read and really enjoyed was part of my Agatha Christie reading project. I have a separate video that I posted recently for that, which I'll link above here. And this was called Adventure of the Christmas Pudding. Um, and this is part of the Hercule, Hercule Poirot um, investigation series. So this was a short story novella, very short, about 60 pages or so. And this follows Poirot as he investigates the theft of a royal ruby belonging to this bratty young prince who gave it to his mistress when he was supposed to be saving it for his betrothed and now the jewel's missing and there's a scandal about to erupt and Poirot has to try to go undercover and find out who the thief was and how to get the jewel back. So this had a lot of nice Christmas holiday theming in it. I felt like it was a great example of Poirot's character. I finally got to know him in this way that I can see is so beloved by so many fans of Agatha Christie and Poirot in general. He was just so quirky and charming and I like how the story unfolded. I loved the characters. There's the main character, Mrs. Lacey, who was, you know, quirky in her own way and she just had a funny way of talking about her family drama. I liked how Poirot discovered who done it. So I really, really enjoyed this. I gave it four stars um, and I'm really excited to keep going with my Agatha Christie reading project. The next book is going to be The Secret Advers Adversary for anyone who wants to read along, which is the first book in the Tommy and Tuppence series. So loved that. Now my last three books were all five stars. I know maybe I'm a little generous with my five stars, but I can't help it. I absolutely love these books. So first we have Call the Midwife by Jennifer Wirth. I listened to this as an audiobook and it was absolutely amazing. This is a nonfiction memoir about a midwife named Jenny who uh, 
It follows her life in her early 20s as she's training to be a midwife under the nuns that are assigned to train her. And she's stationed in the slums, in the poorest areas of the East End in London. And she just talks about her experiences of learning from these nuns, of her own spiritual journey, of learning about midwifery and all the situations she's placed in, all the people she meets, all the families that she helps. And it was so well done. It was so well organized. The stories kind of interwove within each other. I loved her voice. I loved the medical stuff she talks about. I loved the whole midwifery part. It was very heartwarming. There were so many, um, you know, just emotional times within the book that made me feel sad and happy. And I absolutely adored it. I loved this book so much. It was such a great audio listening experience. And I'm definitely going to be going on. I think this is a trilogy. So really looking forward to continuing on in that series and in watching the Netflix show. Then we have my one and only banned book that I got to this year. Although I'm not sure is Heartstopper banned. I'll have to look at that. But this one is called I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And this book was Oh, it was beautiful. It, the writing in this book was absolutely beautiful. Um, this is the first book I've ever read by Maya Angelou, and it's um, part memoir. It's the it's one of her memoirs. She's written several, but this focuses on her early life. So, the book starts out when she's really young, maybe around three years old, when her parents kind of dump her off to the grandparents in Alabama. And then it spans on until she's about 16 and a very um, pivotal moment happens in her life. And that's where the book concludes. But the writing was beautiful. And I listened to this as audio. I also bought a physical copy because I just, it was so beautiful. I'm definitely going to be rereading this again and just having my favorite pieces of prose scattered throughout. And it was just a, uh, it was such a look at you know, what it was like for her to grow up in the segregated South, you know, facing all that she had to face on top of the, the challenges she had as a young black girl. We also get into the challenges she had as an innocent child being preyed upon by the adults around her. Now, this does have some trigger warnings, which I'll leave below in the comments, in the comment bar thing, in the info bar. Um, so check those out before you decide to read this because it is not an easy book to read and it's some of the more difficult scenes are told with such a childlike innocence that it just can move you right to tears. Just uh, what she goes through and how she adapts to that and how she tries to reinvent her identity and reclaim her feminism and her sexuality and her identity as a black woman and finding pride in that. So it was an absolutely gorgeous book. Um, I, I loved it so much. So yeah, one of my favorite books of the month for sure. So the final book that I read, and I would say probably my favorite just in terms of the emotional journey I had taking this book was called The Only Plane in the Sky, An Oral History of 9-11. And this was written by Gareth Garrett. And I listened to this one as an audiobook as well. Um, I bought the physical copy too because I loved it so much. But this book was absolutely breathtaking. It blew me away. This is a masterpiece of history in my opinion. I'm still in awe over it. Um, this was the final book I think I finished in January and I just can't get over it still. So I think what really made this book so phenomenal for me was that it was performed by a 45 person audio cast. So it's basically it takes you through the entire day of September 11th. Um, the terrorist attack on New York City, the Pentagon, and the the uh, plane that was, you know, deterred from hitting likely probably the White House. But it takes it starts from the night before, and it takes you through the entire day, and then there's an epilogue which kind of wraps things up as as to where we are now. But it's comprised of over 500 interviews with different people from family members from people that were in the building, people that were in the tower when it crushed, people that were supposed to be at work that day, students that were, went to school and didn't know what their parent, where their parents were. It's interviews from firefighters, police chiefs, um, news reporters, news anchors. It's just this like all-encompassing 360-degree view of 
the events of 9-11 and it goes event by event by event. And I think what blew me away so much about this book is how the author was able to take all these interviews. Um, and also we have audio recordings of the flight attendant who was the first person to call in about the first hijacked plane. And it's, it's her real voice. It's her real emotion. It's the real voices of the air traffic control as they're receiving that call. It's the real voices of President Bush as he's addressing the nation and Barack Obama when bin Laden was caught. And it's just all of these different things pieced together to make such an incredible story that the, the interviews, he found a way to play them off of each other and to wrap you into the story where you feel like you were really there with them. Now, when 9-11 occurred back in 20. 20- 01, 2001, I was in college. I was a college senior and I was sitting in a lab class and we were like in the, it was some science lab I was taking, some zoology lab. And the professor cut the class short and he's like, oh my gosh. And he turned on the radio and we were all listening to it. But like, that's kind of my only memory of that. So because I was young and I maybe didn't grasp the entire spectrum of what had happened, reading this book, really gave me a sense of that day and how it affected our country and how it has affected how travel is now and how security is now and how the world around us is now and what that day means to so many people that experienced this firsthand, that had family members that were unfortunately passed away because of this and the tragedy of it all. And it was such a powerful book for me. I cried so many times during this book. It's it's definitely an emotional read. Not in the same sense of like, um, I don't know. It was a different kind of emotional read because you're you're hearing about the kindness of strangers and how the people came together at New York and the Pentagon to help each other and to stay with each other when they could have ran the other way. And the, the bravery of the first responders that rushed towards this cloud. I mean, you're getting people's recollections of what it felt like to be trapped in the building, what it felt like when the tower was coming down around them, what it felt like to be caught up in this cloud of concrete and people were pulling dust out of their mouth in order to breathe. And it was just, it was amazing. It, it's not an easy book. Trigger warnings below, but this book blew me away. It was my favorite book of the month. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share my enthusiasm for that, but it was such a great reading month, you guys. I hope if you haven't read any of these, maybe you'll check some of them out. But thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you to each and every one of you that has subscribed to my channel and has left me a comment to know that you're to let me know you're there. I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys have a great uh, rest of your day and a wonderful reading month ahead. And thank you for watching.